Shall we begin? So I think uh, we can begin the session uh, as all the authors, as far as I can see, are uh, online. Hello and welcome to the eighth uh, session of CHESS 2020, where six paper on machine learning, more precisely uh, the application of machine learning in side channel analysis uh, will be presented. The first speaker in this session is Gabriel Zaid, who presents the paper methodology for efficient CNN uh, architecture in profiling attacks. Uh, and the papers written by Gabriel Zaid, Lilian Busse, uh, Amori Hapbrot, I'm, I'm very sorry if I'm not pronouncing the names correctly, and Alexander Veneli. Gabriel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, just before starting the presentation, um, I just want to know if you can see the slides. Uh, everything is okay? Yes, we can okay, see that. Wonderful. So thank you very much for this introduction. Uh, I'm Gabriel. I'm a PhD student from the European Laboratory and the Thales ITSEF. And today I will summarize you a methodology for efficiency and architectures in profiling attacks in order to reduce the desynchronization effect. So this work is a joint work with Lilian Bosch and Amory Abra from the European Laboratory and Alexandre Venelli from the Thales ITSEF. So first, as, al uh, as um, already presented at just 2017 by Eleonora Kegli et al, we know that the convolutional neural networks are useful to reduce the desynchronization effects thanks to, thanks to its uh, translation invariance property. So typically, a CNN can be decomposed into two parts. The first part, the convolutional part, aims at extracting the relevant information from the input in order to retrieve uh, in, uh, such that in such a context, the relevant information is characterized by the point of interest. Then the classification part recombines these relevant information in order to accurately classify the input. So in our work, we decided to focus our interest on the convolutional part only in order to understand how does some parameters affect the point of interest detection. So this is our question, how to select modality parameters for efficiency and architectures in profiling attacks. In our work, we conducted some theoretical investigation and to validate our observations, we introduced two visualization tools newly investigated in such a context, namely the weight visualization and the heat maps, such that first, um, the weight visualization are, uh, is used to evaluate the ability how the convolutional part to accurately recover the sensitive information. So this kind of uh, visualization tool is very helpful to understand how does some parameters such that the filter size, the number of convolutional blocks affect the point of interest detection. And typically this kind of uh, weight visualization, just to clarify your point, should, be should not be considered as a performance metric, but more like a way to evaluate how does some parameters affect the point of interest detection. And then the heat maps are helpful in order to um, visualize the convolution operation between an input and a filter, such that we can understand deeply how does the filter activate the relevant information. So by plotting the heat maps for each convolutional blocks, for example, we can deeply understand how the, the, the convolutional part of our CNN works. So here we can see the different hyperparameters we investigated on, uh, the filter size, the pooling layers, and the convolutional blocks. And in our paper, we uh, try to understand how does these hyperparameters affect the point of interest detection. Unfortunately, due to the lack of time, I cannot deeply explain you how does these parameters affect the, the, the detection of the leakage. So I recommend you to read the, the, the reference paper that we mentioned here. So once we understood how does these parameters affect the point of interest detection, we decided to generate a new methodology and more precisely a new kind of convolutional part in order to first reduce the, the, the complexity of the convolutional part and then limit the effect of the desynchronization. So to quickly understand our methodology, let's take a look to a brief example. So let's assume that an adversary has access to a physical device such that the SNR computation is given as follows. So the goal of our 
methodology, as I already mentioned, is to generate a new kind of convolutional part so that we drastically reduce the truss dimension so that at the end of our convolutional part, the intermediate truss we obtain define the amount of relevant information in different parts of our input. So just to clarify this point here, for example, the first green point defines the amount of relevant information in the first part of our input. Then the second green point defines obviously also the, um, the amount of relevant information in the, in the second part of our input and so on and so forth. So by applying this methodology, we first drastically reduce the, the, the complexity of our convolutional part and also the, we limit the impact of the desynchronization effect. So to validate our methodology, we decided to apply a wide range of use case, but here I just give you some um, hints on the ASCAD data set that is considered as the main common base database used in a deep learning based HNN approach, such that here a random data effect is implemented. So by applying our methodology, what we want is to reduce this desynchronization effect. So thanks to these slides, two things can be observed. The first one is in comparison with the, the previous state of the art, when we apply our methodology, we observe that the complexity of the network is drastically reduced as well as the training time. And then because we want to understand if our methodology limit the impact of the desynchronization, we have to compare the performance of our methodology with a network train on the ASCAD um, synchronized stresses. And when we did that, we observed that the number of attack trusses that are needed for retrieving the, the secret key are similar, roughly to, to 200 trusses. So it was wonderful. First, thanks to these observations, we can confirm that our methodology limit the impact of the desynchronization effect and mostly the, the random delay effect. And then an, an, an interesting point is that when small trusses are considered, the, the, the network complexity does not have to, to be huge in order to perform efficient profiling attacks and efficient site attacks. And this observation was recently confirmed on larger trusses, such that more than uh, 100,000 samples are considered. So maybe there is no correlation between the, the network complexity and the trust dimension, but this question obviously is still open. And finally, uh, just before conclude uh, my, my, my short talk, I suggest you to read our short paper entitled Understanding Methodology for Efficiency in Architectures in Profiling Attacks, because this short paper um, clarifies some points that are misunderstood by the revisiting paper that Leonard will introduce you in a few minutes. So to get a, a complete overview of our work, I deeply recommend you to first read our methodology paper, then the revisiting paper, and finally conclude on the understanding paper in order to understand uh, all the concepts we, we, we introduced. So thank you very much for listening. If you have some questions, do not hesitate. I'd be happy to answer or, or do not uh, hesitate to contact me over email. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Gabriel. Um, Esteban, uh, could you find any uh, question asked uh, by our audience? I do not see any, any questions from the audience uh, in Zulip or in uh, Zoom chat. So maybe I can ask a question. Yeah. Um, so how, how difficult is, would be to use your methodology for some completely different data set, completely different setup? So how easy is to, to map it, to really use it as a methodology? So for, um, this paper is maybe the first paper and maybe something should be um, improved in order to consider this as a concrete methodology because there is some limitation. For example, in our paper, in our paper we um, set some hyperparameters depending on the desynchronization effect we know but uh, in, a con in, a, in, a, in a real example, maybe we do not exactly know what is the, the, the desynchronization effect that in some cases it could be difficult to, to, to perform. But for example, in all the data sets we used, we uh, just follow the, the methodology we introduced. So 
we define the, the, the value of the parameters depending on the desynchronization effect that occurs on the different data sets. And we just apply our methodology and we observe that we obtain the, 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 base state, the, ba the best state of the art results on all the data sets that are introduced in the, in the literature. Okay, thank you. Um, still no questions from, from audience? So if there is no other question, uh, I can ask a, a, question, a quick question, I would say. Um, um, you said that you have studied the impact of pooling layers uh, yeah. as well as some other hyperparameters. Can you just give us a hint um, on uh, the impact of pooling layers compared to the size of uh, the filters? Is it... Um, do you have any suggestions what to do when it comes to uh, choosing the uh, pooling layers or something um, that can uh, tell us which of those hyperparameters are more um, important to select yep. when you are doing site analysis? So typically, uh, uh, a convolutional part is composed by different uh, convolutional blocks, and each convolutional block is composed by one convolutional layer and one pooling layer. So um, the filter size com um, composed the, the, the convolutional layer. So depending on the size of the filter, we focus the interest of the network on localized um, features or more global equage areas. So depending on what you, you want to detect, you have to set the, the parameter as you want. For example, in our methodology, we want first to focus the network on the, the leakage area in order to reduce as much as possible the desynchronization effect. Then uh, for the pooling layers, there is uh, the pooling layers is very interesting because uh, it, it uh, helps to reduce the trust dimension in, and keep as much as possible uh, relevant information. So, um, and typically, there is two kinds of pooling operation that can be considered, the average pooling and the max pooling. So depending on the, the operation we want to, to perform, there is some limitations. For example, in the worst case scenario, the max pooling layers can be uh, and, um, difficult to apply in such a context because we can discard some relevant uh, information and we can, uh, cannot use them during our, our um, our, uh, the resulted attacks. So um, it's it, it very depending on the, the data set we want to attack, but uh, uh, I don't know if I have to your question. Yes, um, that was very helpful. Uh, actually, uh, my question was mainly related to the uh, comparison between those uh, hyperparameters and which uh, pooling um, okay. mechanism is uh, more uh, recommended uh, by uh, your uh, study. Yep. Okay, uh, let's uh, thank uh, Gabriel for the thank nice talk okay. and just answering the uh, question. And uh, let me introduce the next speaker, uh, Leonard Wouters. Sorry if I don't <laughs> pronounce it correctly. Um, and the paper is um, entitled Revisiting a Methodology for Efficient CNN Architecture in Profiling Attacks. And the paper is written by, um, just a moment, there's something wrong with my laptop. The paper is written by uh, Leonard Wouters, uh, Victor Aribas, Benedict Gerlich, and Bart Prenil. Um, Leonard, you have the floor. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. So as is probably evident from the title of our paper, we revisit the methodology that was, that was just introduced by Gabriel. So I have to thank Gabriel for the nice introduction to our talk and also for providing his code online because this made it a lot easier for us to perform our experiments. Now, for those of you that just tuned in, um, a quick recap of the methodology is that we will design a CNN architecture. At the input, we have uh, input features or in our case, side channel traces. These will be fed into a first convolutional block in which the filter size is set to one. This is a very unconventional choice, which one we will explore in more detail later on. Then if there is misalignment present in the traces, we will 
add another convolutional block in which the filter size is equal to half of the maximum misalignment present in the data set. Finally, there's a flattened layer, a, fully, a few fully connected layers, and finally, an output classification layer. Now, if we think about this first convolutional block with filters of size one, what it is really doing is it is learning a weight and a bias, and it's going to multiply each sample in the trace by the same weight and adding the same bias, meaning that you will get a scaled and shifted representation of the same trace. If you have four filters, you will do this four times, and so you end up with four shifted representations of the same information, which did not strike us as being very useful. So we decided to remove this first layer from the network and then try to apply more classical means of pre-processing that are widely established in the field of machine learning. Now, if you look at some of the results, we can see that um, simply pre-processing the traces and removing the first convolutional block we get results that um, perform as well, if not better, than the original models. So here you can see with feature standardization and feature scaling between minus one and one, we get very nice results and stable results over multiple training processes. Whereas if we use feature scaling between zero and one, as was proposed uh, in the paper by Zaid et al, we get unstable results. Then by removing this first convolutional block, we also have the added advantage that we can reduce the complexity of the network. So our networks have at least 50% less parameters than the original models. In the paper, we perform also multiple experiments on different um, network parameters, such as the filter size and the number of convolutional blocks. So in contrast to what Gabriel just explained, how they try to reduce the filter size and the number of convolutional blocks, we propose to do the opposite. So we increase the filter size and we increase the number of convolutional blocks. And this in an attempt to increase the receptive field of the network and thus getting more stable results. Now, finally, for the second convolutional block, um, Gabriel proposed to use filters uh, with a size that is equal to half of the maximum misalignment present in the data set. Now, if we look at the AS random delay data set, um, it isn't really clear how much misalignment is actually present. So what we decided to do is train a model, a model that performs well on this data set, and then basically give the model two traces and ask the model which input samples did you use to make your classification. And that's basically the result you can see on this slide. And as you can see, there's for this specific example, there's at least 500 samples of desynchronization present. So this would mean that you would have to use uh, filters of size 250. Now, if we look at the model that was proposed by Gabriel, he used uh, filters of size 50. So that is not really what he proposed in the methodology. But then if we go a step further and we enumerate a lot of these filter sizes, we can see that on this specific data set, it doesn't matter. It does not matter at all which filter size you choose. You will always get a good result and you can get the key out with six traces. Now, to conclude this presentation, um, we have to say that the methodology that was proposed does work well on all of the explored data sets, but this does not give us any guarantees about unknown data sets. We think that some of the design elements can be improved, such as the first convolutional block and the use of pre-processing techniques. We think that some of the design rationales need to be reconsidered, such as the uh, second convolutional block. And then we also think that um, profile side channel attacks can be considered a specific application of time series classification. And this field is slightly more mature than side channel analysis or uh, machine learning for side channel analysis. And so I think it makes sense to ask ourselves what we can learn from this more established field. For example, they have a UCR time series archive, and this is a big archive of data sets with more than 100 data sets. If you propose a new technique in this field, you are expected to evaluate your models over all of these data sets before your paper is even considered useful. Now, finally, I think uh, two conclusions that are relevant for all machine learning papers. Uh, it's often straightforward to demonstrate that your novel machine learning ID works, but I think we can increase the value of the research a lot by also understanding the limitations of the approach. And of course, I don't expect you to take my word for it, but maybe you will listen to Francois Collet. So Francois is the creator of Keras, which is the machine learning framework that most of us use. And he says that you should spend at least 10% of your experimentation time on an honest effort to disprove your thesis. Now, finally, there's a few very common uh, machine learning mistakes that we should all try to avoid. 
There's a paper titled Troubling Trends in Machine Learning Scholarship by Lipton and Steinhardt, which is a very good summary of all of these mistakes. So that was it for my presentation. Um, similar to Gabrielle, our code is also online and I'm willing to answer all of your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Leonard. Do we have any question, uh, Ms. Taylor? Uh, it seems no questions. Uh, Again, no, not in Zoom or Zoom. So let me ask a question. So uh, one of your slides showed that your approach had good results on zero one scaling versus um, uh, Zaid et al methodology did not have uh, good results. So could you explain why is that? So why do you have good results? So uh, scaling, so what Zaid et al did was they scaled features between zero and one. Mm -hmm. And it's actually well known that doing this will make it more difficult for a network to converge to a working solution because all of your inputs are positive. So that's why usually people scale between minus one and one or they perform feature standardization. Now, doing this feature wise is easy in the case of misalignment, uh, in the case of align traces. In the case of misalignment, you cannot apply these techniques straightforwardly. But what they do in the field of time series classification is simply apply the same techniques we apply them horizontally or on a per trace basis. And this is also something we, we do in our paper where we have basically the same plot for uh, misaligned data sets. Um, in line with this uh, question, I would like to ask, uh, do you think that this rescaling um, of the features uh, to have uh, them uh, just between minus one and one um, can be helpful for other neural networks. So um, what I have understood is that you have tried that for CNNs. Do you think that it can also have some positive impact on the performance of other um, neural networks or have you tried any other network rather than um, CNNs? So um, for, for the, this specific slide, these are actually MLP networks and not CNNs. So here you can also see that it also works for MLP networks. So these were originally, originally CNNs because they had this first convolutional block, but because we decided to remove it, they are now basically MLP networks. Okay, okay, I, I see, I see. Uh, so oh, these results are for MLPs. Okay. They are basically MLPs, yes, because we remove the first uh, convolutional filters. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank you. Okay. If, if there are no more questions, and it seems there are none, let's let's continue. Uh, with the with the third program uh, with the third paper of this of this session, uh, thank you, uh, Leonard, for for your nice presentation and very insightful answers. So the the third uh, talk of the session is a novel evaluation metric for deep learning based side channel analysis and its extended application to imbalanced data. The presenter is Jaja Jan. Hopefully I pronounced it correctly. Okay, thanks, thanks for, the, for the introduction and good morning everyone. Uh, for profiling attacks, we first collect our such and traces and calculate the labels and start the training process. After training process, we use the maximum likelihood method to mount attack. We calculate the scores using this equation and discriminate which key is most likely to be the right one. This is, this is the equation on how to calculate the maximum likelihood score. From this equation, we can see why deep learning metrics such as accuracy is not suitable for such an analysis. Deep learning metric accuracy is designed to show the performance of the model for a single prediction. However, in profiling attack, we are given a set of traces generated with the same key. Accuracy did not see the underlying mechanism, so 
it is constant, it concentrates too much on the labels. That's also where the objectives of classification and profiling attack have, have conflicts. So we need to design a new deep learning metric to evaluate the deep learning models for such an analysis. Right before I give a new metric, I first define the cross entropy for key hypotheses. Let LK be labels generated with key hypothesis K. Then the cross entropy between the true distribution and the predicted distribution with respect to the key hypothesis K is defined as follows. Actually, there is a tight relation between the maximum likelihood score and cross entropy for key hypotheses. Thanks to the law of the large numbers, we know that the expectation of the opposite of the maximum likelihood score is exactly equal to the cross entropy for, for K. Then let K start with the right key. Our new metric cross entropy ratio is defined as the ratio between the cross entropy for the right key and the wrong key. Combining this definition with equation three, we have some interesting results. Let's cross entropy ratio equals gamma. If we make a difference between the expectation of the scores of the right key and the wrong key, the result is equal to one minus gamma multiply the cross entropy of K. From this equation, we have some observations. First, we know that the cross entropy of K is always positive. So a smaller cross entropy ratio indicates a bigger difference between the expectation of the scores for the right and the wrong key, which means the right key will be more distinguishable. In this way, we link directly our new metric to the attacking process. Also equation five, implies the cross entropy for the wrong key matters in our attacking process, which in turn verifies the definition of the cross entropy ratio metric is reasonable. Here is one experiment of our results. Here from the figure, we can see the cross entropy ratio metric is closely related to such an evaluation metric guessing entropy. A smaller cross entropy ratio indicates the guessing entropy will drop faster, which means the attacking performance is better, which verifies our verifies this equation. To further investigate the performance of cross entropy ratio metric with imbalanced data, we also conduct some experiments. From this figure, we can see when the level of imbalance increases, the deep learning metric accuracy become very misleading. But our metric cross entropy ratio remains faithful in reflecting the attacking results. We also adapt, adapt cross entropy ratio met metric to a new kind of loss functions. Actually, this loss function is just an estimation of cross entropy ratio on the training set. Due to the good properties of cross entropy ratio metric, this loss function helps to remove the influence of the imbalanced data. We test it on several dat public data sets. Mm, and here are some examples with imbalanced data. Mm, here we can see when we use the cross entropy ratio loss function, the tagging efficiency improves greatly. And this is true with different, different uh, deep learning models and different situations, and also with different data sets. Both software and the hardware implementations. In conclusion, we propose a deep learning based such an evaluation metric, cross entropy ratio, which show cross entropy ratio is closely related to the attacking performance and it works stably with imbalanced data. We also adapt cross and ratio metric to new kinds of loss function and properly solve the problem of the imbalanced data in such kind of scenario. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. 
thank you for the presentation. Uh, Fatema, any, any questions from Zoom, Zulip? I think we uh, wanted to take a look, but I can also take oh. a look at that. Sorry. But, uh, first of all, uh, we missed uh, the, uh, Kevin's question uh, at the pre previous talk. So please uh, discuss uh, uh, Kevin's question on the Zulip chat, uh, relevant authors. And uh, 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 no, uh, any questions is not, is not coming to the, to the chat and the Zulip, not yet. yet. So. Uh, may I have a question? Yeah. Uh, I found uh, yeah, so CR usage of the CR loss uh, significantly improves the performance of the DL based side channel analysis. But I'm uh, still wondering so the reason why uh, CR loss uh, improves the uh, uh, so solves the uh, imbalance of data program in uh, DL based SCA. Do you have uh, any explanation for the reason why of the uh, improvement? Mm. I can see that the, the cross interval ratio metric is actually cro closely related to the attacking process. So a smaller cross interval ratio indicates the, the difference between the scores for the right key and the wrong key will be bigger, which means the attack will be, mm, the attacking performance will be better. So we, we, so we modify this cross interval ratio metric to, to the, the loss function. And also we can see um, the cross interval ratio metric is defined over both the cross entropy for the right key and also the cross entropy for the wrong keys. It considers both the right key and the wrong keys. So if we modify to a loss function, it actually learns more than we just use cross entropy loss, loss function. So it learns that it may try to maximize the difference between the right key and the wrong keys instead of trying to, to improving the prediction accuracy, which is not exactly our purpose in such an analysis. So, so if we so also since it used the, the labels from both the right key and the wrong key, so the, the imbalance problem will be counteracted because both both the labels generated from the right key and the labels from the wrong keys are considered. So it has the better performance when dealing with the imbalance data because that's uh, uh, because the imbalance problem should not actually influence the attacking process in such an analysis. It should, because we are not doing classification. Can I ask a short question? Yes. Slide nine. Uh, it seems the difference of the CER uh, metric is not really clean on, on the differences. So uh, we can see the differences between the, those four cases to be of various levels. And yet the, perf the performance guessing entropy doesn't map exactly to those ranges of differences. So how do you map a small difference in CRE? Does it mean a big or small difference in guessing entropy? Yes, the, the cross entropy metric is not so quantified. It cannot be directly connected to the size channel evaluation metric, guess entropy or success rate because the cross entropy ratio metric is not, uh, is not related with uh, the number of traces we are going to mount attack. So it's for its performance is weaker than traditional side channel evaluation metric like guess entropy or success rate, but its advantage is it's a deep learning metric. It can be implemented in deep learning framework very easy and it can be calculated very fast and we do not need to mount practical attacks. So cross entropy ratio, it just uh, um, reflects, just reflects the gas entropy and success rate. And there is uh, a quantified uh, relation between cross entropy ratio and the attacking performance uh, will be our future work. Well, 
if, if there are no more questions. Uh, so I don't have any question, but it's just a uh, kind of uh, notice for um, Leonard. There was a question for you that was uh, not received at the right time. Um, I think at the uh, when we are done, when every speaker uh, presented uh, his or her presentation, then we can go back and take this question because that's a very important question and it is good to discuss it in this session. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Jaja, for your presentation. Thank you. If you have any more questions, you can send me, always send me an email. Um, so the next the next talk of the session is called a uh, comprehensive study of deep learning for side channel analysis. The authors are Loic Masur, Cecile Dumas, and Emmanuel Proof. And speaker will be Loic Masur. Loic, you have the floor. Okay, thank you, Stepan. Uh, can you hear me? Can you see my slides? Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, this talk is uh, closely related to the previous one, uh, namely uh, assessing which uh, performance metric is relevant from a side channel analysis point of view uh, when using machine learning and more especially deep learning. Um, a quick recall about how to train a neural network for profile SCA. So uh, I assume that everyone knows uh, what is a profile SCA? So you assume you, that you have a clone device of a real target uh, acting as an open sample. So you can uh, guess, uh, you can know the secret key used for encryption. Based on that, you can know the values of a sensitive intermediate computation uh, closely related to the key, to the secret key to guess. Meanwhile, you can acquire some traces with an oscilloscope uh, denoting the physical measurement that you observe. And those traces are given to a model here denoted by F. Uh, typically, this model can be a neural network, but this can be any uh, other learning algorithm, as long as it is parameterized by uh, here the parameters theta. And this model will output uh, some uh, scores, a score vector, one score for each hypothetical value of Z. And these scores are given to a loss function uh, whose aim is to compare the scores with the expected value, uh, the, the value of Z expected for the corresponding two traces. And training a neural network is nothing but uh, minimizing this loss function. So ideally in uh, such analysis, we would like our loss function to be closely related to the uh, such channel analysis metric. For example, uh, if we note uh, by NA of F, the required number of traces to succeed an attack with a model F and NA attack traces beyond a given threshold beta, uh, typically 90%. Uh, this would be uh, ideal from an evaluator's point of view uh, because it, allow, it would allow to guess the very minimal value required to, uh, to succeed an attack, which is the ultimate information an evaluator uh, would like to get uh, to assess the security level of uh, the real target. The problem is that if you, for, technical, so for some technical reasons, which are details in the paper, this cannot uh, be uh, directly optimized. So we have to choose a surrogate loss. Uh, and the question, which is uh, similar to the question raised in the previous talk, is uh, which surrogate loss to choose to still minimize uh, this quantity in order to guess uh, n star. So uh, let me give you some uh, some clues about uh, which loss function would be suitable. Uh, I propose you to uh, consider this axis on which uh, we plot the the entropy of the sensitive target variable z. Uh, typically, z is an eight bits if you take the output of the first ASS box. And since we have access to observations of uh, leakages, we, can, uh, we may decrease this entropy up to the conditional entropy of Z given X. The difference between those two entropies is uh, known as the mutual information between Z and X. 
And uh, last year at the Chess 2019, Shirize and Crofus emphasized the fact that uh, the MI can be uh, related to uh, our ultimate SC metric, namely NA star. The minimal, uh, the minimum number of traces required to succeed the attack with probability beyond a given threshold beta, where beta here is uh, used to compute a given known function. Uh, this uh, function is taken from the Chirize et al. paper. The problem is that uh, the mutual information can be only computed if you know the real, the true leakage model, which is can which cannot be assumed. Uh, actually, so um, the sidechain analysis community introduced an extension of the MI called the perceived information, also known as PI, which takes uh, instead of the true leakage model, an assumed leakage model, namely the leakage model returned by the model parameterized by uh, the vector FIDA. And last year at uh, Crypto 2019, Bronchin and Crawfers uh, rec recalled that uh, the PI was always a lower bound of the mutual information. The mutual information is constant. This depends on uh, the nature of a model. So uh, in a sense, it would be nice to find a way to maximize this quantity so that we can have a nice uh, clue of the mutual information. And actually, uh, the, it turns out that uh, uh, the one of the most widely used loss function in machine learning and especially deep learning, namely the negative log likelihood loss function, which is closely related to the cross entropy defined in the previous talk, is actually uh, linked to uh, this notion of PI. So that we can, uh, we can make a computation uh, allowing to uh, compute the PI based on the value of a loss function, uh, which can be uh, even monitored during the training. So since uh, training a neural network is uh, training a learning algorithm is nothing but minimizing the loss function, it, uh, it is equivalent to maximize the PI. The remaining question is that uh, to what extent the remaining gap between the maximum PI obtained with uh, our, our training and the MI, uh, to what extent this gap is tight or loose? And this is somewhat our second contribution in uh, this paper. We have verified um, in uh, simulations and experiments, whether uh, this uh, gap is uh, tight or loose, and it turns out it is uh, uh, it is tight uh, in uh, many context in many contexts with uh, lots of uh, countermeasures. Uh, the takeaway messages uh, actually, uh, I would like you to uh, remind that uh, machine learning and leakage assessment use uh, the same concept, the same mathematical objects, uh, but with different terminologies. In uh, machine learning, we often talk about uh, cross entropy, entropy, and uh, in uh, such analysis, we prefer, we rather use the terms uh, perceived information, mutual information, but basically those are the same, uh, the same concepts. We have shown here that uh, minimizing, choosing the NLL loss uh, as a loss function to uh, minimize is actually equivalent to maximizing the PI. This may give a uh, tight lower bound of EMI. This has been uh, verified on simulations and experience. Uh, and uh, finally, thanks to this computation of PI, which is close to EMI, we can have some accurate estimations of the ultimate SC metric, namely NA star. And we have verified this, this claim on the public data sets. I have a few more slides in Appendix if you have some questions about that. Uh, and uh, all in all, uh, so this methodology is uh, sound from an evaluator's point of view because we can quantitatively uh, measure the impacts uh, of the countermeasures in terms of mutual information. Thank you. And if you have some questions, I would be delighted to answer. Thank you. Ray, do we have any questions? Uh, no question not coming. Uh, uh, question not coming to the European uh, Zoom chat. Not yet. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, may I have uh, one question? Sure. Yes. Yes. Uh, my question is the uh, uh, tightness of the of your band, uh, lower band. So, how do you think? Uh, uh, how tight is uh, your band? 
uh, with um, um, uh, yeah. uh, especially compa uh, compared to the conventional method of attack. Um, so if I understand rightly your question, you 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 ask whether the the lower bound is tight or, or loose. Is that? I yes, tight or okay. loose. Okay. Okay. Uh, I can show you, for example, uh, a, a quick example on simulations. Um, so we simulated a leakage model with Amming weight and Gaussian noise. Uh, we estimated the VMI with the Monte Carlo simulations, and we computed the perceived information with uh, by minimizing the loss function of a simple uh, neural network. So what you can see here is the MI. Uh, so this is a, a known uh, tabulate value. Uh, on different uh, uh, examples, uh, on the left with masking, with different uh, orders, and on the right with shuffling, with different numbers of uh, bytes who are shuffled. So this uh, illustrates uh, usual cases uh, with uh, in presence of countermeasures. And what you can see here is that the crosses denoted the pi high are always lower than uh, the curves, but are still really close and almost superposed in different cases and also in at different scales. So without countermeasure, you have an almost perfect uh, superposition at, uh, for example, uh, at the order of magnitude of uh, 10 to the minus one bits, but this can be decreased to uh, almost to 10 to the minus five in presence, for example, of four shares. Uh, so this, uh, that is why we claim that uh, this, uh, this lower bound can be uh, really tight. Obviously, those are simulations. On the uh, actual uh, traces, this can be a bit uh, more difficult. But uh, what we can see is that there is no intrinsic uh, limitations, no theoretical limitations to, uh, to estimate the MI with uh, PI maximization. Okay. Did, did I uh, answer correctly your, your question? Yeah, yeah I'm such a job. OK, uh, thank you, Lloyd, for, for your presentation. And let's, let's continue with the rest of the papers, right? Thank you. Uh, OK. Uh, <clears throat> OK, let's move to the next uh, presentation. Uh, next talk is uh, about uh, strength in numbers. Improving generalization with ensembles in machine learning based profile to social analysis. Uh, the talk is provided by Gilham Perrin. Okay, okay. Uh, please start. Uh, well, good morning. Uh, do you see my screen? Uh, great. Okay, let me. Okay, so thank you for joining this presentation. I will, uh, so I will be discussing also before and the, the nice uh, previous talks, we have seen uh, different ways to compute, uh, uh, different ways to approach for uh, different metrics and deep learning for such an analysis and also how to uh, find uh, optimal hyperparameters. So in this work, uh, it's also in the, uh, in the context of uh, profiled SCA. And uh, our proposal here is not exactly to, uh, to choose optimal hyperparameters, uh, but how to combine multiple models uh, into one single model that is, uh, can perform efficiently uh, in the fine tuning process of hyperparameters. So basically what we look for here is a way to uh, find good enough generalization, a concept that we define in the paper that means that we are uh, simply finding a way that to generalize uh, in that test phase, in the attack phase, that is uh, good enough to recover the key. So, so the motivation for this work came from the, the uh, let's say, the consistencies of the met, uh, uh, machine learning supervised uh, classification metrics uh, with such side channel analysis methods. So, uh, here in this slide, you can see uh, clearly that. Uh, in, when we are attacking a masked AS, for example, with a multiple layer perceptron, uh, what we get is usually a high training accuracy. And on the other hand, if, when we test or validate uh, this model, uh, the accuracy is very low and doesn't really represent uh, sometimes the successful key recovery that we have uh, in the test phase. So then, 
uh, to solve this problem and see how we can improve this generalization, uh, even if we have very poor uh, class classification metrics, supervising, uh, let's say, very poor accuracy, uh, we started to have a closer look into the uh, predictions that we have when we classify a trace set. So basically the output class probability. So looking to the, uh, when uh, classify a trace set, what we get basically is an array uh, of probabilities, every probability representing uh, what, how, what's the likelihood that a trace I in this uh, trace set uh, contains a certain label, certain, uh, for example, uh, Hamming weight. So here an example when we have a Hamming weight leakage model for a byte, and every uh, row in this uh, in this uh, uh, table represents uh, the probability for all the uh, for the, all the trace, and every column represents the probability for a specific label. So uh, when we compute key ranking, we basically select those probabilities from this um, from this array. And the way we select is based on the prediction for what, which label we're going to have according to certain key guess. And then we do the summation probability using the equation here. And uh, so we just uh, assume that the maximum pro uh, summation probability will be uh, associated to the, to the correct key candidate. Uh, so if we look to the, um, for example, uh, so we try. We find a way to represent uh, the way the key rank is computed using this uh, density or distribution of class probability rank. So if you look to the to the figure on the on the right, you see that the first uh, the, the the column represented by class probability rank one basically means that uh, basically means the accuracy of the classification. And then uh, if we, uh, so uh, what we can see is that when we have a sort of good classification accuracy, let's say in a leaky AS target, uh, most of the probabil class probabilities for the correct key will be, uh, let's say, concentrated as, uh, as lower ranks. Uh, uh, so we'll be ranked as first, the second, and third, and so forth. And very few uh, traces uh, will be associated to uh, high ranked probabilities in that array. Uh, the scenario is similar, but uh, with a uh, slight, uh, with a different nature. If we look to the to a masked AS results, when we, classification accuracy is not very good, uh, let's say very low, and doesn't represent the success uh, of the successful key recovery. Uh, even then, uh, if you look to the distribution of the probabilities again, we can see that um, most of the probabilities for the correct candidates are uh, pushed towards the first ranks again. And the probabilities related to high ranks are always basically appear less for the correct key candidate. So this kind of explains why uh, summing up multiple traces, you can uh, using multiple traces in the, in the attack phase can lead to you uh, successful key recall. And then we start to analyze how how this uh, behavior for different uh, models, and then change very small hyper uh, the amounts of hyperparameters, or simply modifying one layer, or even batch size or learning rate, we start to see many different behaviors. Even when we uh, re retrain the same model twice, the, the, we see different uh, probability distributions in, this, uh, in that table. So uh, we start to ask ourselves, how can we improve this? How can we make this, um, uh, this model more robust in a way that it performs better? And then uh, the solution for that was simply to uh, aggregate multiple uh, models into one in a way that we construct an ensemble. So uh, what we do is to sell, is to combine the multiple probabilities from multiple uh, uh, models into a into a stronger model, and then for that we can train, let's say, uh, a set of a high number of models, and then select a subset of this model that represent the best models. And this the selection is done simply by using a side channel metric such as, such as Gaussian entropy to uh, select what models are, are, are the good ones. So here a representation again of the uh, distribution, and we can see that, that uh, when we train 50 models and we select 10 good models out of it, we can see that the distribution of the probabilities for the correct key candidate uh, is more, uh, it can be more, better distinguished from the incorrect key candidates for, meaning that uh, we have a better a separation of the summation probability for this correct key byte. And even looking to the best single model selected out of 50 training models, which we vary hyperparameters on these models, let's say multiple uh, 50 MLPs or 50 CNNs, 
and the single best model out of 50 models is still cannot uh, it does it, it still is not really distinguished but for uh, for the incorrect candidates so we can uh, what we saw then is that ag aggregating multiple models really pr uh, improves the uh, success rate and guessing entropy convergence so to quickly uh, show some results here we we, we tested this uh, approach on multiple data sets and but here i only have results for ASCAD to be short and we can see that uh, in all these scenarios, uh, the ensemble results for multiple, for even assembling all the 50 models that we, uh, we tested, or even assembling 10 best models, it's always better than simply electing a, a, a best model out of the, the group of models that we test. So some uh, conclusions that, uh, uh, that we, uh, we had in this work is that we believe that output class probabilities can be a valid, distinguish, a valid distinguisher in sidechain analysis if we can uh, somehow formalize this distribution of probabilities and then use it as a metric. Also, uh, we saw how sensitive uh, the variations uh, can be for different, uh, even retraining the same model or small variations in hyperparameters. So ensembles tends to uh, remove these uh, variations in the, in the results. So we also would like to uh, mention that it, it, this process doesn't replace hyperparameter search, uh, but it, it sort of relaxes the fine tuning process that we used to uh, go through when we are trying to find an efficient model. So what we say is that instead of just uh, electing a single best model that uh, performs better for a specific metric, uh, ensemble them uh, could, could, tends to provide a superior result. Uh, so for that, uh, it's also important to mention that it's not for any hyperparameter that you put there, but it's, it's a process that is recommended to apply when you have some sort of uh, reasonable hyperparameters in some uh, finely tuning phase. So ensembles, also, they don't improve the overall learnability of the models, but they improve, uh, they improve uh, how uh, single models already learn. So yeah, and then we have some feature works that we are going through now. And yeah, so this presentation comes to the end. And thank you for uh, thank you for watching. And if you have questions, I would be happy to answer them. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful talk. Uh, there is one question in the chat room, and um, uh, this is uh, asked by Luc Masur, if I pronounce it correctly. And the question is. Could, uh, could your visualization for class probability work when not assuming Hamming weight as a label, for example, uh, with um, 256 classes instead of nine? Yes, yeah, so uh, this was already, this was also done in the, during the, uh, when we were elaborating this work. And uh, we don't have, the, so the, to, uh, to put a visual distribution of identity model, for example, is. Uh, would be a bit complicated for uh, representation, but in our experiments, it's it, when we are reaching uh, good results with identity model, it's even better distinguished for than uh, Hemingway. The, the distribution of the you, you would see uh, this distribution going much higher for the correct key, and uh, all the wrong key candidates are sort of uh, equally distributed here. So identity model, you can see even better this. Uh, the distinguishing uh, of correct key for ensembles. Um, thank you. If there is no other question, because I cannot find anything else in the chat room, we can go uh, to the next uh, presentation. I want to uh, uh, wait. Uh, uh, there is a question from uh, Yannick. Of course. Uh, Yannick at the Zoom chat. So uh, how to choose the models uh, to have the optimal combination? Can they uh, be also go there once? Yeah, so this is a very important question, and so uh, we the, the, so our paper doesn't uh, they, we don't propose how to select, for example, what is the number of layers, what is the number of filters, and so uh, we assume that we are in a, so for these data sets that we test, they are all software AS implementations. So uh, we can say that we don't see uh, it's not really as. Uh, I'm, uh, let's say insanely difficult to find a model that performs well on this data set. So uh, there are some leakage there, I would say. And then, but uh, 
but I think this the the, the ensembles. Uh, how can I answer directly this question? I think so. Our proposal is not for finding those hyperparameters, but to how to uh, optimize when you reach some state uh, where you, you have some good hyperparameters already. But to find these good hyperparameters, then I think a previous process should be applied. So it, it needs to go to another uh, process before. So that, uh, we don't solve this problem of finding the, the hyperparameters. Thanks. Uh, let's thank okay. the speech again. Okay, let's uh, move to the final talk. Uh, next talk is about uh, uh, plain text, uh, missing feature for enhancing the power of deep learning in side channel analysis, uh, breaking multiple layers of side channel countermeasures. The talk will be provided by An Chan Fan. Please start. Anchan? Anchan? Can you hear us? Um, a while ago, I could see that uh, the authors were online, but now I cannot find them. Um, I would like to ask the last speaker, Anchan, to uh, share the screen and um, unfortunately I cannot find uh, the author in the list to unmute uh, their microphone. Uh, so I, I have a suggestion if uh, the speaker uh, is not here now, uh, let's discuss the nice question asked uh, from uh, Leonard. Leonard, are you here still uh, with us? Yeah, I'm still here. Uh, wonderful. So let me just uh, quickly read the question. The question was related to uh, mainly um, the first part is a nice note on the importance of uh, making the codes available. And then the question is, do you think that um, many software tools being developed for machine learning are well suited to cryptographic application? And do you have any recommendation for how to improve the reprodu reproducibility of the results? Yeah, so I already answered the question in the chat. Um, but to quickly recap, I think call up from Google is, is nice, uh, especially for reviewers, because you can send them a link and they can quickly go through your code, just run a few cells and see that they can at least reproduce the results that you claim in, in the paper. You can also add markdown to it to explain what you're actually doing. Um, and, and they don't need to set up any software. They don't need specialized hardware like GPUs, because that's all provided for free in, in these call up notebooks. But then I think it's also nice to have all of your code on GitHub so that it's easy to just clone the GitHub repository, uh, run a few Python scripts, and then see that you can reproduce the results. And I think it's also quite easy to make your code publicly available. You had to write it anyway to, to get the results for your paper. And uh, yeah, I, I would even say that if I read a machine learning paper that doesn't have the code online, I immediately ask myself the question, what are you trying to hide? Yeah, the, 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 um, I wouldn't uh, ask such a question as a matter of fact, but I would say that um, it is fair to share what you have observed with your colleagues. And because we know that um, for um, machine learning uh, more specifically, uh, this is quite hard to reproduce the, the results. It is great to share that with your colleagues and um, receiving some comments and um, some um, help from them can be very much valuable. Uh, 
Um, there is another uh, question uh, about the last paper, and uh, it is asked uh, from Neil Hanley if uh, uh, I don't know if uh, he or she is present now, but uh, it is asked if uh, he or she can um, comment on uh, the results of the last paper presented in this session. I can see that uh, he's here and he's uh, unmuted. If you hear us, can you please uh, answer this question? Okay, um, uh, there was a, a problem with the uh, Wi-Fi uh, at uh, Chuang's uh, place. And um, actually, as a matter of fact, uh, we uh, ran out of time and uh, the presenter is not here. Um, and um, Okay, I can see that um, he is the co-author of the last paper. If you want to comment on your results or if you want to just encourage the audience to um, just watch your video, the floor is yours. Um, Neil, can you hear us? Okay. Uh, I suggest that uh, we uh, just finish this session now. And I would like to encourage all the audience to um, watch the videos of the last presentation. Unfortunately, due to some uh, technical uh, problems at the presenter's uh, place, we couldn't uh, have the last uh, presentation. Um, let me thank all the speakers again. And uh, if you have any other question, please do not hesitate to ask them offline, send them some messages or some um, uh, text in the chat room. Thank you.